Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Amazing Podcast. Uh, whether you're watching or listening, we appreciate just the time that you spend uh, tuning in every now and then to hear what's the latest and greatest in the space of cloud native and Kubernetes. And uh, that's what we talk about all the time here, just the Kubernetes, cloud native, and everything around. It's, it's such a huge uh, diverse ecosystem, and we want to bring you perspectives from uh, you know, the, the vendors. Uh, we want to bring you even uh, perspectives from uh, some of the key organizations that are actually steering the whole uh, space itself. And that's what we're doing today even. Uh, we're going to be actually talking to someone uh, who is no stranger. Uh, we have with us Taylor Dolezal, who is uh, the head of ecosystem at uh, the CNCF. And uh, we're going to be talking today a bit about uh, the, the upcoming big event from uh, that the CNCF organizes uh, each year, one in the US, one in the EU. And I think they have some more uh, other places coming up. I heard there's one in India coming up later this year. Uh, but uh, the one that's right around the corner, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, most of all, is KubeCon EU, which is happening in Paris. And it's on the 18th to the 21st of April. The amazing team is going to be there. Uh, I won't be there myself. I would love to be there, maybe the next one. But the amazing team is going to be there. So uh, we're going to be recording, doing interviews with uh, many of the vendors and the end users. Uh, to talk about things they're doing with, with Kubernetes and in the cloud native space. And we'll be publishing all of that stuff right here. So, so say, stay tuned if you, if you want to catch uh, all of that, uh, you know, the, the, the conversations between the, the keynotes and, and the, the stage uh, talks. That's going to be what we are covering. Uh, so stay tuned to Amazing for all of that. Um, so, so KubeCon EU is happening. If you haven't registered already, definitely go. There's still time. Uh, there's still about two months left. And even if you can't make it in person, there, there's a, there is a virtual uh, registration. Is, is that still open, Taylor, the virtual registration as of today? Yeah, there's uh, with uh, KubeCon Paris, we've started to see a lot more folks join in person. So we don't have a virtual component anymore. Uh, it's all just oh, in person yeah. this time. But... For folks that aren't able to make it, we do. We're going to be uploading those YouTube videos as soon as we have them available. Um, uh, typically, our co-located events, which will happen on like day zero of the event, uh, those will get uploaded first, and then after the other videos have been processed, usually it takes about like one to two weeks, I think, in in most cases. So, uh, if you can't make it in person, uh, not a problem. We'll get those videos up on YouTube, and you can check them out. Oh, all right. Wow, that's new. Uh, is that just for this event alone that there's no virtual registration or is it something that going forward that's going to be the trend? Likely going forward, that will be the trend. And then same thing, we're going to try to make those videos available sooner. Uh, we just have some partners to talk through and, and things on that front. But um, yeah, with we, we've just seen such a, a big swing back into in-person events and uh, just the logistics for getting uh, live streaming and everything like that has been a little bit problematic on that front. Uh, so yeah, shifting shifting to in-person events and uh, prioritizing that. Right, all right. But yeah, it's good that uh, the recordings are going to be up there. And so we can catch up maybe just uh, a day or two later, I don't know, or a week later. But yeah, it's, it's pretty much uh, similar to the virtual attendance. So that's great. Um, so I want to talk a bit about just uh, different topics that uh, are on your mind, on the mind of, you know, people attending KubeCon. Uh, you know, if you could, uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the reasons that people come to KubeCon is to hear, you know, uh, what others are doing with uh, these open source projects, and uh, you know, how are people building stuff. Uh, the end user stories is uh, is what people come to KubeCon to hear. And so uh, if you could tell us, uh, you know, give us a teaser of this year, what's in store at KubeCon EU, and what are some of the uh, interesting end user stories that you're looking forward to hear most? Yeah, so I uh, I was just taking a look at the schedule this morning and kind of filling out what talks I would like to see um, and uh, making sure that I booked off time for uh, the end user keynote, which I'll be giving at KubeCon. So definitely want to make sure that that's blocked off on my calendar. Uh, and then I'm, I'm on stage at the right time. But uh, what's new about uh, this, our sorry, schedule? Sorry, 
I was going to ask, is this your first keynote as well at the KubeCon? No, no, it's uh, yeah, oh, okay. old old hat for me now. Yeah, but uh, love oh, getting okay. to chat with people, <laughs> talk about the ecosystem, make puns, and everything like that. Okay, um, okay. yeah, cool, cool. very exciting. Yeah. It's it's yes, it's the thing. first. It it'll be the first time that we've done like a breakout and themed days. So day one is going to be a little bit more general. Priyanka is going to give the keynote that day. Um, then the next day is going to be end user themed where I'm going to start uh, and kick off the keynotes. And then the last day is going to be more community themed and talking about projects, communities, technical uh, action groups, et cetera. So uh, that's that's the first time that we're adopting these themed days. And, and we're really excited to do that because it keeps it a little bit more focused and it helps better plan the day too, depending on what you want to see, what you want to hear. <laughs> all right, all right. Great. Uh, so any any particular end user stories that, you know, like caught your attention that as you're scanning the script, the schedule, anything at all that stands out that you're really looking forward to hear? There's I'm I'm most curious on hearing how folks are thinking about their generative AI, ML ops, LLM ops, like all of those uh, new buzzwords that are kind of coming about as part of uh, this new hype cycle that we're seeing. I know most folks, they're like, oh, I've heard about, I've heard so much about AI, you know, I'm kind of getting tired of it. You have some people on that side of the fence, uh, others that have mm -hmm. been like, really want to adopt it, but don't know how, like you had said earlier, you know, this is a great place to showcase what's being done and, and what work people are actually doing. Maybe some things to copy and to use in your organization or to test and try out. Um, I'm really stoked about hearing more of some of those stories and I've already gotten to talk to a few people leading up to the event about how they're thinking through security concerns when it comes to generative AI, um, data classification, and like how to set up their data such that they can use this in the future, or um, is that even right for their organization? Can't they just rely on some other uh, principles or practices like ML ops? And yeah, do we need an LLM for that? Or is that something that we can just use a database for? Can we use statistics? A lot of conversations like that, as well as observability, is is one that really has my uh, ha has my attention. I'm curious how folks are starting to measure those concerns and what the actual needs are of those organizations. Is it productivity? Is it adding features to cloud native projects? What what does this actually look like when it's starting to become uh, instantiated within these projects within these workflows? So that definitely has my attention and my focus for sure. Um, definitely the more like buzzy, buzzy topic for everybody. Um, a lot of things focused on platform engineering, security, um, and then developer experience and productivity, I think are the other things that I'm really curious to tune into. Um, some things around sustainability as well and uh, cost savings too. Those, those typically go hand in hand when it comes to talk topics. Um, and then I, I, I'm also, I'm starting to learn the Rust programming language on my own. So people talking about uh, power consumption of Rust versus you know, Python or C++ or Go, um, also fascinating conversations. So really curious to hear more from end users on that front. Uh, pl plenty are talking, so uh, still working on my schedule and which ones I'm actually gonna go to. I'm excited. Yeah, there's just so much you really have to be intentional about where you are and how you wanna spend your time there. Uh, but yeah, AI is, is really interesting how it's really, uh, you know, caught everyone's attention. It kind of reminds me of just, uh, you know, going back to 2014, 15, when Docker just came on stage and then, you know, um, everyone was running to all of the Docker talks, uh, you know, and it, it's kind of like that now with AI. But but the interesting thing is that, you know, uh, AI seems like, you know, there's, there's a lot of congruence where AI is being built on top of cloud native unlike where people saw Docker as opposed to traditional virtualization. Uh, so, so there seems a lot of uh, similarities and a lot of alignment between even AI and cloud native. And that's really interesting, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of the questions that I've gotten personally have been around, how do we think about these things at different parts of the stack? You know, is it um, because you have to have the hardware in many cap in many contexts, and and to have that capability is really important for folks. Um, then you know within the CNCF, we're mostly focused on the infrastructure and how to put those things together, the hardware and the applications, and being at the cross section of that concern. And then a lot of talk about uh, actual like application development and what are the primitives, what are the concerns around AI that will be helpful to have. 
Um, so trying to bucket it for each of those three different types of concerns and go up and down the stack is uh, what another thing that I'm really interested in. And I've had a lot of conversations with people around. Um, we're, we're seeing some folks say that, you know, to train models and to use them in the way that they'd want to, they just can't get the hardware. Um, or there isn't a good specification or standard when it comes to developing applications. But one thing that is for certain is uh, so many folks are using Kubernetes and Slurm to actually make those kinds of workflows happen when it comes to the infrastructure layer. Uh, and we're seeing more folks uh, utilize Kubernetes as the way to, you know, they have GPUs, how do they schedule them? How do they orchestrate and plan out their, their application paths and workflows? That's that's most uh, we're we're seeing Kubernetes adoption go through the roof on that front, which is yet yet another good story. Yeah, I want to dig in a bit to talk about just AI, and because even the last time you were with us, you uh, shed light on how infrastructure and hardware is the real challenge with AI, even though the use cases get all of the attention and the talk. And I want to ask about uh, for someone coming to KubeCon, uh, and if they're interested to know more about. Uh, these the key challenges as you were talking about, which is the hardware and the infrastructure layers. Uh, is there enough talks for them to visit to understand these challenges and even find some solutions to it? Or is it very software centric or very uh, end user application centric at, at, at KubeCon? Our coaches have done a really good job in curating the talks. This I'm, I'm biased, but looking through the schedule, they've done a really great job of focusing on the 101 type areas where you're just getting involved and trying to figure some of these things out or just kind of want to have a high level discussion, as well as all the way into like the 401 or really advanced topics in how to adopt certain things when it comes to AI. Um, and then we also have an AI hub event happening where that's a very focused kind of breakout uh, set of sessions that are happening. Uh, at KubeCon. Uh, we also have, uh, I can get to the, into this a little bit later when we talk about sustainability things as well, but we're also co-hosting uh, an event with the, or we're hosting, and then we've pulled in the United Nations to, uh, for a hackathon, uh, Cloud Native Hacks is the event, and there's a $10,000 USD prize as far as the best project. We'll have judges and uh, people that'll be looking at, I think it's a list of 10 different concerns that the UN has raised uh, all of them around sustainability and adoption. So uh, there's truly a, a whole bunch of things to focus on at KubeCon. But uh, like you said earlier, you know, it's just like, what what do you spend time on? What do you actually go to? There's 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 just so much to do at KubeCon. It's, it's near impossible to fit it all in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, sounds exciting. Uh, hackathon and prizes around sustainability. So that's part of the AI hub you're, you're saying, right? Yeah, AI Hub is one, and then the Cloud Native Hacks event is is a separate event, and then we have our talks. So yeah, again, it's different buckets of events, and then my my all time favorite is definitely the hallway track, which is just out in the hallway finding folks that you want to connect with and talk to um, that have either given talks or it's like, oh, I know this person's going to KubeCon. I really want to meet up with them and get their opinion on you know X, Y, and Z. Uh, that's it. Truly, is one of the best places to 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 find people within our ecosystem and to, to have that magic happen in the hallway track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I want to ask about, uh, you know, going from AI to another big topic, which is on a lot of people's minds is uh, security. And uh, I think uh, that's something that, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, I mean, organizations may cut costs in different places, but, you know, they're always, uh, you know, want to, you know, uh, allocate as much budget as possible to security because it's so crucial and it's so important. Uh, what do you think uh, is in store for, you know, around security? What kind of conversations and ideas do you expect to hear at KubeCon EU this year around security? Around security, I think that it, it's, there's a lot of, um, especially around AI and everything else too, it's the data pieces that are really critical. So, uh, what is, do you set up proxies in front of your LLMs and other parts of your application? Um, the short answer, it seems like, yes, that's what a lot of folks are doing end users specifically, uh, because you don't want to ask uh, your, your AI uh, workflow a question that might contain sensitive information or PII, uh, personally identifiable information. Uh, uh, to really want to be mindful about how to share out sensitive things and how to leverage some of these new technologies. But one of the things that's really starting to come to the forefront is air-gapped networks. We're seeing a whole bunch of uh, folks work within disconnected states. 
Um, so th like nodes that'll join Kubernetes and then not, and then join again, you know, whether that's transportation kind of context or um, we, we've seen that in a couple different, um, uh, mostly transportation, but a couple other contexts within edge networks and, and whatnot. So uh, that's that's also been quite interesting and newer areas for us to explore within the security space. Um, SBOMs, uh, security bill of materials, uh, has also been something that we've, it, that's also been coming up quite a bit, but we're starting to see a lot more maturity on that front. And then with a lot of governmental regulation, um, that's what the governments are starting to ask for is give me some kind of artifact or asset that we can use to see what's inside of the software beyond dependencies, you know, build times and all of these other things as well. So those are the key things that we're seeing within security. And then it's been a positive shift kind of getting out of some of the, you know, uh, previous generations of thinking about you know, like, oh, we change this manually on purpose because th then we know we change it. It's really locked down to more auto automated ways of securing your uh, footprint, getting rid of, you know, your root user, distro list images. Uh, we're seeing a, a lot of things that have been in process for a while start to evolve and start to mature on that front. So uh, really, yeah, our work will never be done in security, uh, which is uh, you know, good and a bad thing, but mostly a good thing, I'd say. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a lot out there that, uh, you know, we could, we could go and uh, explore at the event. I want to ask if someone is in security and they also are curious to learn about, let's say, networking or something else, right? You were mentioning that now uh, the event is now structured in, uh, I think, different sections or different days, I saw is is what it's called on the, on the schedule. Uh, so if someone is uh, registering and signing up for the security track, uh, how do they you know, go for another talk and say networking or platform engineering uh, in the middle somewhere. How, how do they plan that? Yeah, so our uh, our schedule, which is online, it really does help us as a foundation. If you go through and you take a look at the schedule and you actually add like the check mark and if you tag the events that you're going to go to, uh, we get that telemetry. So that's very helpful for us in capacity planning, looking at rooms and all of those things, seeing what's relevant to our community. So. Um, I highly recommend setting your schedule and, and checking off the things that you're going to be going to, because that again, that just really helps us with planning. Um, and then even though we have themed days as far as like keynotes and some other events, uh, we have those tracks which will span throughout the entirety of the conference. So, you know, if you look at the security track or AI, uh, ML AI track, those will span multiple days. And then that's supposed to be able to help you out when it comes to planning like okay, I'm, you know, whether you're a security expert or like, if you wanted to, you're like ML AI, that's all I want to focus on. That'll help you make your selection as you go through the days and you can just follow that track essentially. So there's a lot of different ways that you can take a look at the existing schedule and then kind of like dice and chop that up into exactly what kind of content that you want to take in. Got it, got it. Uh, so, you know, moving from security, which is something that, you know, is always top of mind for organizations to something that's more recently top of mind uh, and kind of a phenomenon, especially today, given the economy, uh, kind of a situation where, you know, a lot of organizations are thinking about FinOps, cost optimization. How do we get more with the same budget without affecting performance? Those are the kind of things that uh, a lot of organizations are thinking of right now and they want to listen to those kind of talks that address these issues. Uh, so, you know, that being the case, could you, uh, you know, uh, talk to us a bit about what you see with these talks? What, where, where do they come from? What kind of organizations are doing these talks? What are some of the key ideas that you see surfacing uh, for KubeCon EU around FinOps and cloud cost optimization? I think when it comes to cloud optim or cloud cost optimization, we're, we're definitely seeing a huge increase as companies are tightening up their budgets, like you said, with the market and everything like that. Uh, a lot of uh, managers and CFOs and, and people from that discipline are really starting to ask the, do we need this? Can we shrink this bill? Do we need logging? What What's important is, is the core question that's coming out of those discussions. And uh, that's causing engineering teams to take a look at that too. Um, the biggest change that we've seen in the past like five years is giving developers the ability to actually see the bill, you know, like more CPUs costs more, same with RAM or new services or specific services. So we're seeing, uh, we, we have a, a partner foundation also under the Linux foundation called the uh, FinOps Foundation, 
And they specifically look at concerns like that. And uh, mostly is like uh, more the CFOs and cost, uh, cost uh, accounting kinds of teams that work over there. And then they'll interface with engineers and other people focused on engineering within the CNCF. So uh, we work really well in tandem with one another. And then in the CNCF, we have a technical uh, advisory group uh, focused on environmental sustainability. And so those that's where we see a lot of uh, talks go in that direction is, yes, we want to be environmentally sustainable, but it's not enough just to say that, right? You know, it's like we, we all want to do more and do better for the planet, but how can we tie that back and make that the right choice that companies choose by default? And in many cases, that's that comes around costs and how to how to enact cost cutting. Do we switch to programming in Rust? You know, is that something that we think about? Um, do we need dev to be on 24 seven? Probably not. So those things really start to impact. And then you, you, it becomes just, it goes beyond cost, but that gives businesses a really good incentive to focus on. And then that in turn, in many cases, helps out environmental sustainability as well. Wow, really uh, interesting to hear about the FinOps Foundation and how CFOs and uh, accounting for the finance folks uh, from different organizations are part of that. Uh, any of them actually giving talks at KubeCon New? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that uh, it's it, it, within our schedule, I know we have quite a few talks on that front. And then we'll do a lot of collaborations with the FinOps uh, Foundation too. Like we've done previous things at, at reInvent and some meetups and uh, other types of events to just network and talk with people. But uh, truly, you know, there we work really well together because both of our focuses are on the cloud, just in different uh, aspects and specificities. Uh, you know, related to just uh, reducing costs, the unfortunate uh, happening recently is that you know there have been uh, quite a few layoffs. Even recently, uh, many companies announcing the new round of layoffs. Uh, you know, after layoffs last year. So there are quite a few, uh, there's a lot of great talent, uh, yeah, another way to put it, you know, a lot of great talent that's out there uh, just looking for their next uh, big opportunity, the, the next uh, company to join in, the next product to believe in. And uh, there's going to be quite a few of them, I think, at KubeCon EU. And so, you know, if, if some of them are here listening to this uh, and, you know, uh, they want to get the most out of their uh, time at KubeCon EU, what would you have to say to them? I would say, yeah, I'd say prioritize KubeCon. It's a great place to network. It's a great place to find, you know, many, many folks will will show up to KubeCon. They'll be hiring. It's just a great uh, uh, pulse point to check in at as far as our ecosystem goes. Um, yeah, that's that's been the unfortunate thing. I've had friends affected by that and, and family affected by that. So it's it's always unfortunate to see, though, it's uh, we've got a really warm and vibrant community that always has doors open. There's always folks hiring within our e ecosystem. So um, yeah, it, KubeCon is a great place to really get a sense for who those folks are and, uh, and get an idea as far as what to focus on next in your career. You know, maybe you're focused within one aspect or security and you want to you know, jump into observability or some other kind of form or function. Um, no better place than checking out KubeCon and kind of getting a sense for what the buzzwords are, what the areas are, focuses, architectures, just what's going on in the world. Uh, really great place, uh, the CNCF in general, just a really great place to see where all those things are surfaced and get a little bit better idea of, as to what's going on. Um, we do have a whole bunch of programs uh, that will, what, uh, what is it, uh, scholarships essentially. Uh, so folks, if you're uh, far away from the event, you want to apply to come. I believe all those are closed now because it's so close to the event. Um, but, you know, if you're looking for our next event in Salt Lake City or the next uh, uh, EU event, um, we're, you know, that's a great thing to leverage uh, and we have funds available for. And then in many cases, closer to the event, we'll have uh, folks affected by job losses or local folks. Um, there's there's ways to get tickets on that front too. So stay tuned to our Twitter accounts and, and social media feeds on that front uh, as we have a little bit more information closer to the event. But uh, yeah, we truly want to help. Um, and we're always talking with people that are hiring and people that are looking for jobs. And we're always happy to help make those connections too. Uh, we also have jobs.cncf.io is, is a great place to check out as well. You can filter, look for remote jobs, jobs in a specific area too. Uh, and that's completely open as well. You can post your jobs in there for your organization or create a profile as somebody looking for a new opportunity as well. Uh, so yeah, we're here to help. Uh, we're here to help and, and help educate as much as we can. 
Uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, Linux Foundation and CNCF certification and training programs, um, several of which are completely free uh, that are worth checking out as well. So yeah, again, we're just happy to help you level up and make those connections where it makes sense. Wow, I think uh, that actually the, there's a good plan in there in what you said that, you know, uh, job.cncf is a great place to start off, I think, because you can do that right away, right from home. And then, uh, you know, zero on a couple of companies that look interesting and then go there and meet those companies. You know, many of them are going to be there. Uh, that that sounds like something that could really, really work for anyone looking uh, for a job next. And so, yeah, those are some great tips. Um, yeah, so uh, as we wind down our conversation, I want to uh, lastly touch on the topic of just uh, uh, cloud sustain sustainability. And, uh, you know, uh, it is new and it's not something, sustainability is not something that, you know, organizations have thought of for decades. It's it's quite new uh, in just this, the conversations. And so uh, give us kind of an introduction of what it means and what are some of the interesting things around sustainability uh, that you've been noticing recently? I think I've, I've noticed it a little bit more in the EU as I've had conversations with folks within that area. Um, I, I definitely heard it from like uh, APAC, EMEA, you know, just different places around the world have different areas of focus. But uh, I've seen a lot of that from countries within the European Union is focus on uh, what's our what's our uh, carbon impact? What is I, I see a lot more conversations with that as the uh, core theme. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see as many happening within the United States where where I'm at. Um, but I I see them increasing, but not as prevalent as as, as I've seen in the European Union, for example. Um, and uh, the that typically gets related to the cost component. Um, but also it, it, we're starting to see engineers and developers think about, you know, can we scale this down to cost zero dollars? Do we have to have such a big impact or does this work workload? Can we make it more resilient? Can we kind of like refactor it and make it smaller? Um, that's typically tied to the cost concern, but then we're able to take a look at that from an environmental impact and sustainability impact as well. Um, we don't want to in, it, uh, have an impact in terms of performance either. So a lot of conversations around that. I'm seeing some interesting conversations around WebAssembly and uh, different type, like how can we remake these workflows such that they're still performant, that they're sustainable, but also a little bit cheaper for us as well. So that's a, a very interesting conversations there. Still a lot to be figured out as well. Um, typically within our disciplines, what we'll do is the end goal is, you know, satisfy our stakeholders. Let's actually write something that works, right? And then we start to pare back uh, in terms of the cost and everything else. You know, we don't want to run up millions and billions of dollars of cloud costs, you know, initially, of course, but we we want to get this working and then we can refactor and make it better and better and better. So um, that that's many of the cycles when I talk with end users as far as what happens. You know, it's typically burst up and then pare it down and make it a little bit more efficient as time goes on. Um, we have our end user tab technical advisory board that has kicked off as well. And we're going to, that group's going to be sharing recommended architectures, radars, and more assets. It'll be helpful to end users as they navigate those challenges too. So, um, they're going to be joining me on stage, uh, during day two as part of the end user keynotes and areas of focus. So stay tuned on that front. Um, they're just getting booted up, so we don't have everything figured out just yet, but. Uh, those are some of their core concerns as well as how do we knowledge share effectively so that we can all make use of this rather than each learning these things within our specific and separate organizations. How do we tie them together and how do we evangelize uh, some of these best practices and ways to go about doing things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, uh, sustainability is something that I think it, it tends to be kind of top down driven. And it's nice that, you know, uh, at a conference like this, we're talking about it where developers who actually you know, um, get stuff done uh, that really make a difference on the front lines that they get to, you know, learn about this and get to go and uh, try something that uh, can make a difference in terms of sustainability. Uh, so it kind of uh, builds that pressure, not just top down, but then made or, you know, bottom up as well, kind of grassroots, uh, you know, uh, growth for for sustainability. And so so that's that's really interesting as well. Uh, and uh, do, do you see that happening? Uh, have you even heard stories of, you know, people coming, learning or kind of, you know, 
uh, getting a few ideas around sustainability, going back, trying some things, you know, taking it to even uh, their, their their bosses, different other uh, stakeholders in the organization, and really, you know, uh, doing something around sustainability after after the event itself. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that there's a couple of specifications that are coming out. Um, not from the CNCF, but some uh, related groups and people that work within the CNCF ecosystem around how do we measure power of data centers or workloads. Um, the CNCF does have a project called Open Cost, which I believe just moved to incubating. And so that's a really good way of uh, measuring your costs and other concerns within Kubernetes, for example. Um, I definitely see a focus on groups trying to establish specifications and standards that we can actually use to, again, concentrate our efforts and really work uh, together on these things rather than, oh, we figured this out for organization X and, oh, we did it over here at Y a little bit differently. It, that just, it, that doesn't scale. And it might take a little bit longer working with the community, um, but helps us really establish something that we all can benefit from. It, it makes sense to have that discussion unilaterally with so many people. Um, somewhat related, we've also had uh, some end users join our organization that are focused on some of these things where we're seeing environmental impacts. Like uh, one group, I believe it's called Raincoat. Uh, they actually go and they provide like small uh, uh, loans for people affected by natural disasters and then kind of help them get back up on their feet after something terrible has happened. Uh, you know, hurricanes, tsunamis, all of these things. So we're starting to have some members join the organization where they're uh, they're helping these people directly affected to some of these larger environmental things that are going on, uh, which is I, I I love hearing those stories of people you know getting through something really tough and then getting back up on their feet and uh, and and being you know stronger and better off as far as uh, uh, rather than you know just something terrible happens and then they're just kind of stuck within that position. So uh, love hearing those stories and and uh, seeing those kinds of organizations join the foundation too. I definitely would love to see more of that. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I think that's how you uh, make sustainability not something that's just on paper, but actually in practice, uh, living it out. Uh, some great examples there. Uh, so that's it uh, for uh, our discussion on uh, all things around KubeCon EU. Uh, so before you go, Taylor, I got a couple of uh, questions to uh, get to know you a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, here goes. Uh, what are you most looking forward to in Paris uh, the city itself. The city itself, I, I I love being able to go and just like soak up the city that we have these events in. So Paris is no exception. I'm absolutely looking forward to the food. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, So I can't wait to try everything, uh, literally everything on that front. That'll be really fun. Um, the museums, the art, the culture, I definitely want to make the most of that too. You know, going and checking out the Louvre, hopefully. Um, I did have a chance a uh, little bit ago to go uh, check that out, but definitely want to go back. I didn't get to see every picture and every piece of art in there. So that would be really fun too. Croissants, breakfasts, all, all of those things I'm very much looking forward to, um, as well as the architecture, and then just getting a better chance to understand the culture um, within, within Paris, within France itself too. Uh, really like getting to see how each part of the world is different and take a little bit of that with me as I uh, sadly ha have to leave at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds exciting. Uh, what do you do after a KubeCon typically? How do you unwind? For me, uh, usually it's uh, typically most of our staff will take about a week off afterwards from KubeCon, still checking in on some emails and other things. But me personally, I like either coming home and just having a really solid staycation at home and uh, catching up on books I haven't read and just kind of thinking on some of the conversations that we had during KubeCon. But uh, yeah, usually it's just catching up on sleep and trying to make sure that your inbox doesn't uh, go over the the thousands of messages. You know, stay stay hopefully the low hundreds. <laughs> but um, that's typically how I'll unwind is just come home, get some hikes out, read some books, catch up with friends and family. Because uh, leading up to the event, it really does pull you away as part of, as of a lot of the planning and everything like that goes. So it's nice to kind of like uh, uh, feel the success of an event well done catch up with people and then just really mentally refresh yourself for the, uh, the weeks to come and the next KubeCon that comes along. Yeah. Wow. Uh, hundred, hundred, hundred emails are good for you. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm an inbox thing. zero person myself. So I'm like, Oh, I gotta, you know, <laughs> I want to, I want to triage them. You used the last time you were here, 
Uh, could you mention that again? Which one is that? Uh, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, I missed the question. There's an email tool that you you are sharing that you oh. use, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I'm a very avid uh, super. It was it Superhuman is is my favorite email client, and so yeah, I can schedule things. Um, yeah, uh, archive them, etc. That really helps me keep on top of everything. But uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, the snooze feature mostly just to make sure that I don't forget something or a conversation. But uh, yeah, love love getting to inbox zero. But I've learned it's only a state of mind. It's not a permanent place. Uh, you'll <laughs> it's, it, it won't last long. So celebrate it when you have it. Uh, what kind of traveler are you? Are you uh, well planned? Got, get everything ready way ahead of time, and uh, you know, or are you very last minute? Just at the end of it, just cramming, putting whatever you can find in the bag, sending off some last minute messages, and running to the airport. What kind of traveler are you? I like to think I'm well planned, but I think that's just my ego, and <laughs> in a way, I like to think of myself. Typically, I'll get ready for like I'll start packing and stuff like that before I go about one to two days before. So would love it if I was like, oh, I packed my suitcase last week. We're fine. Uh, you know, I'd love to get to that point, but I'm definitely not there. And then when it comes to uh, uh, being at the events and everything, I'll, uh, you know, try to set up my room nice, the closet, all my stuff and things and nicely put my suitcase in a, in a place that'll make packing up easy. Um, but uh, so mostly well-planned. It's not definitely not a rush, but um, the events that I'd gone to over the past month, I did have two near misses in terms of both my flight out to the event and then a train ride um, where I literally it was like last to board and things like that. So not my typical kind of uh, 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 MO, but that's, uh, you know, sometimes that happens too. So uh, it's honestly a little bit of a mix, but I try to lean more towards well-planned whenever possible. Neat. neat. Uh, so tell us something in French. So I had to learn, I, I did have to look this up before, but, and I uh, hopefully don't butcher it too bad, but I uh, I learned this in French. It was la cloud, cloud native est pour toujours, which is uh, cloud native is forever, uh, which which I definitely believe. I'm biased working for the CNCF, but that's that's what I believe. Uh, did you Google translate this or somebody actually I, told I, you? I used it. <laughs> uh, one of the hidden features of uh, GPTs and other uh, AI models is that they're really good at translations and will capture like the nuance and the form. So I, I used a chat GPT for this one, uh, if I'm being honest. But uh, yeah, I uh, definitely need to learn up on a few more French phrases before I go. Uh, yeah, last question for you is, uh, what's one hack that helps you get more out of uh, an event like KubeCon? Or another way to think of it is, you know, you being an organizer, uh, you know, you probably get tired in between now and then at the event itself. What's a hack that helps you keep going when you're really tired at the event? I think really just trying to be in tune, being being honest with myself. They're, they're, these are all kind of boring hacks, but they're really helpful for me. And it's like naps when you can, you know, it's really hard to navigate that. Um, focusing on the event as a marathon, it's not a sprint. So don't push yourself near the beginning of the week. If you do, I recommend the latter part of it just because there's so many days to go through if you're staying for the full event. Um, and then uh, try to get in some exercise too, typically in the morning or the afternoon, go for a run, do a workout or something like that just to help adjust to time zones. Like I'm based in, in uh, Los Angeles. When I'm going to Paris, definitely want to try to write level set as quickly as possible. Drink tons of water, figure out your caffeine, make sure that you have all your supplies as best you can. Um, most hotels will let you uh, get that delivered or you can schedule some things you can ask them like, hey, do you have this stuff on site? That, which I highly recommend. It's the worst to be in your hotel room, get done with all your traveling, get ready, you know, get to your room check-in and you're thirsty or dehydrated. Just, I don't recommend that at all. So those are more my practical tips. I think some, some more fun things are Try to map out the city beforehand too. Uh, try to get like your to-do list all ready about a week or two beforehand of places you might want to see, or just getting a, a better understanding of some of the key things around the area that you're staying to. That's really helpful. Um, it's the worst to be at the event and then try to be figuring all these things out in real time. It can be really stressful with um, the event itself going on as well. So yeah, prep as much as you can. And um, yeah, I'm curious to see, I haven't seen any like cool open source tools or things like that specifically devoted to these kinds of trips or travel, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure that we'll see some of those pop up within the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Wow, those are some cool uh, hacks there. I especially like the one that said, uh, 
you know, don't go all out on day one itself. Uh, you know, it's a marathon or a sprint, so save it for the last day or two uh, if you really want to go all out. And so that was really that was really insightful. Someone who uh, is an event pro like you would only come, you know uh, be able to think uh, about those things. So that, that was really cool. Um, <laughs> it's I've, I've uh, had to learn the hard way too. So yeah, yeah. Please learn from my mistakes. <laughs> get sleep. Get sleep. <laughs> uh, Thanks so much, Taylor, for joining us. I know you're really busy. Uh, you've been traveling, you've been planning the event, but thanks for taking this time out uh, here to kind of get us excited about KubeCon EU. Uh, really appreciate you joining. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Twain. And uh, to all of our uh, viewers and listeners, uh, you know, if, if you have some plans or if you're thinking about it, definitely, uh, you know, go and uh, attend KubeCon EU. It's going to be very exciting. It'll be, it'll be a lot of learning. And even like we discussed, if you're in the space looking for uh, uh, your next job opportunity. This, this is a great uh, way to uh, to go job hunting and to, to, to meet people. Uh, and there's just so many reasons to attend and uh, not to mention Paris itself, the city. And if you're there, definitely uh, connect with Taylor. And uh, the amazing team is going to be there recording. Uh, so if you're uh, one of the vendor companies there that would like your story to be featured on Amazic, uh, get in touch with us uh, uh, at Amazic. You, you can reach out to us through the website. And we'd love to have a conversation with you and uh, share uh, what you're up to uh, on, on the Amazing website. Uh, so that's it. Thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode or at KubeCon EU. Thank you. Bye-bye.